Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Schools Climate Summit, which is part of London Climate Action Week. My name is Malini Mehra, and I am one of the co-chairs of the London Climate Action Week Education Group, and delighted to welcome you to this session, our curriculum session, um, which we will begin with a short introduction by Patrick Moriarty, the head teacher of JCOS, which is one of our lighthouse schools, the lighthouse schools for the faith school sector. Um, I would love to hand over directly to you now, Patrick, for your introductory words. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're delighted to be associated with this wonderful event uh, and delighted also to be waving the flag as a lighthouse faith school. Uh, faith schools are really well placed to play their part, I think, within the education sector as we try to think like a system. JCOS, just to give you a brief outline, is a pluralist Jewish secondary school right at the top of Greater London in every sense. We champion inclusion of every kind. We've got some of the highest uh, EHCP numbers in the country for special educational needs, and we get some of the highest exam results in the country. So there you go. And all that we do is rooted in and looks outwards from strong and open-minded and open-hearted Jewish values with education and humanity at the heart, together with the, the Jewish concept of tikkun olam, which loosely means repairing the world. Uh, but if I also say to you that this Jewish school has me as an ordained Anglican priest as the head teacher, that also, I think, says something about the kind of community that it is. Our story and involvement with these issues starts, as I think it should, with students. The climate action protest two years ago really germinated and galvanized some amazing principled and practical activism among our students, rooted in their own Jewish values and with real support from their synagogues. Uh, they saw a need to respond to the urgent uh, challenges of our times and to make that concrete at school level. And they have come up with an amazing plan, engaging and impressing stakeholders from the staff to the students all the way up to governors and trustees. Uh, we have declared a climate emergency. They've set us some achievable goals and some stretching ones too. They are monitoring in real time our steps towards those. They are truly our students holding us to account and they've ensured sustainable leadership into the future so that when they go, there are people to take their place. And I think it's a model of how to do it. We are determined to make these issues of today part of our curriculum in the widest sense, the things that we're running with. Uh, and we've got, I see it as a kind of ecosystem that links those students and school leaders at all levels together. Our students are helping us think like a system and I hope that can influence the wider sector too. So that is JCOS, delighted to be here. And I'm now handing over to Cindy Ford, who's going to be chairing the next part of today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. What a wonderful introduction. I love that um, uh, ethos, repairing the world. And it's such a pleasure to be here with such a distinguished group of people who I know are very hard at work um, on that. So it's, yeah, my, my first pleasure on this panel to introduce uh, Lord Jim Knight, who probably doesn't need much introduction. He's a former cabinet minister in the Labour government, member of the House of Lords. He's the chair of CAST, ex-Rapid Digital Poverty Alliance, and obviously founded um, the TESS Institute, which is the fifth largest qualifier of teachers in the country. And more latterly, uh, Jim's turned his formidable expertise and firepower onto uh, climate and education and he's been uh, leading a, a wonderful initiative which is emerging as Future Proof Ed, which will be launched with Climate Action at the OECD, UNESCO and Education International on Thursday. So really moving this sector along in a, in a very powerful and impactful way through collaboration. So Jim, over to you. Thanks so much, Cindy. And you know, it's a real pleasure to be invited to this wonderful day in this, this event and congratulations to Melini in, uh, in organising it and it's also great to follow Patrick. I've been a fan of JCOS ever since I was schools minister many many years ago. You know there, there was a time when Nick Gibb wasn't schools minister and, and that was me um, uh, over 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to just take a, a few minutes to talk about is, is in a way my journey to becoming passionate and, and interested and excited and wanting to do something about this agenda. You know, I was at last August, um, as is my want, I was holidaying up in Orkney at the very other end of the country, um, surrounded by big Atlantic seas and huge 
skies and the most beautiful and extraordinary uh, environment, rich in biodiversity, um, thanks in part to the enduring traditional agriculture that um, pervades in, in Orkney. And uh, got a call from an old friend, Scott, who said to me, look, I don't know what you're doing, but um, I'm running the Climate Change Lab at Purpose, which is a, um, a B Corp uh, based out of New York. He was sat in his apartment in Brooklyn. And he said, uh, we're really keen to do something with teachers in the run up to COP next year. Um, could you give us a hand? And yeah, you know, as a politician, uh, I hadn't done enough in my view on the issue of climate change. You know, when I was a minister at DEFRA in 2005, I'd done a little bit, um, you know, I'd put a biodiversity duty uh, on all public bodies in, uh, the, uh, in, a, in a bill that I took through parliament in that job. But my sense was there was more to be done. I'd done bits and bobs in schools, obviously, you know, when I had three years responsibility for them, but there's sort of lingering sense that there was more to be done and there was an urgency. So I was receptive. But I also then had a sense of, yeah, why is this important? Why should I put this first? And clearly students, young people, as had been demonstrated by the Friday strikes and so on, really wanted more, they wanted better. And to the future, tell us that 68% of students want to learn more about the environment. They also instantly tell us that 70% of teachers don't feel sufficiently trained to teach climate change properly. So a strong sense that there was a, that young people really wanted us to do it. And I, you know, I've always thought that it's, it's really important to listen to young people, for those of us involved in education and to engage with them and to give them more agency and more sense of empowerment. So that was a good reason. Why now was an answer, a question that was quickly asked of me. And, and that was in the context of the pandemic, really, you know, with everything else that was going on in the world with COVID and the way it was impacting on everyone, but, you know, teachers having to go to heroic efforts in order to be able to just get the job done and to keep some kind of learning going and to keep schools safe and, you know, too often learning coming far too, you know, way down the agenda because they're having to worry about biosecurity and testing and, you know, dealing with mountains of guidance that the department are throwing at them all the time and head teachers really stressed. How are we going to interrupt them with something else? But my sense, again, thinking about young people was they are, are very conscious that they're living through a health crisis that is translating into an economic crisis. And talk of a climate crisis is dangerous for them if it's yet another thing that they have no control and no impact on. And the opportunity it felt to me was if we get this right, is to use climate as a way of showing them that their actions do have an impact and their actions can aggregate together and really affect change in a positive way. And that change can, is something that you can have agency over, that you can put your arms around and really make a difference um, if, if we get this right. So, uh, and, and one thing I also know from the work the OECD and others have done is that when we're thinking about the competences that young people need, and you know, OECD have done a great piece of work on the competency review for 2030, then agency and giving youth empowerment is a really critical part of any kind of future education system that we want to be able to create. So this was an opportunity. And then also, you know, I've done a lot of work on the future of work. And I'm looking at the de-skilling impact of technology, of global uh, globalization, and potentially, obviously, of a transition from a carbon economy to a carbon zero economy. And that creates a huge need for reskilling and a reskilling uh, agenda for the adult skills world, but also in the end, a need to reshape the way we do education and do schooling in order to prepare young people for a largely carbon zero economy when they leave school. You know, the last debate talked about whether we should be aiming for 2050 or 2030 or 2035 or whatever. Um, but 
if if we hit the target that the government has set for 2035 of 78% of levels of, of 1990 levels, then the child that starts school this September will leave school in 2035 into a largely carbon zero economy. And we need our schooling to change now to equip those young people for a very different mindset, skill set, as well as a knowledge set for that world and to lead a lot of that change, which is why this is urgent so that some of those people who are leaving FE colleges, leaving schools um, in the next year or two, are, feel more confident about taking that journey. And you know, I was on a call last week with um, someone from Cap Gem Gemini, one of the big management consultancy companies, and she was saying, there's a big demand now from corporates for expertise around sustainability that they're bringing it in at a consultancy level. And that can only be a precursor for them for there being a much bigger demand to employ people with those sorts of skills. So yeah, we need to be preparing our young people for explicitly green jobs, for jobs that are about the transition from carbon to a zero carbon uh, 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 labor market, and then for every job being a green job. So there's a huge skills agenda attached to the, the urgency for this. And then finally, I guess, if, if we're gonna be successful at COP, then we need the public as a whole to go through a big behavior change process in terms of the way they consume things the way and, and, and the way they behave in society as a whole. I can't think of a better place to start than in schools. The power of young people, the passion uh, that young people have around this agenda, the pester power at home with their parents and their grandparents and at a community scale is something that we should galvanize and put to the pursuit of this agenda. Schools should reflect the future that we want, not the past that we yearn for. And that is the other great reason why we should do this. So I'd had that call from Scott in Orkney and he got me engaged. As a result, we now, as Cindy has said, and thanks to people like Cindy that we've been consulting with and working with over this period of time since then, we've come up with Future Proofed in partnership with as she said, AIM High and WWF UK and the Eden Project and OECD and Whole Education and National Association of Head Teachers. Let's go zero from Ashton, crucially. We're doing some advocacy work to try and uh, push things along with MPs, which is you know, getting some progress, trying to encourage members of parliament to lobby the elected representatives in their own constituencies on school councils to get behind, in particular, the Let's Go Zero campaign um, from Ashton. But what was interesting was when we were strategizing, we thought, yeah, but the curriculum, the curriculum, it's just too hard to change the curriculum. We haven't got time. We've just got to get on. So we'll just try and encourage school leaders to use their existing curriculum freedoms to do this. And uh, I was inspired by Lorenzo Fioramontini, the Italian minister who had changed their curriculum in Italy in response to their parliament to mandate an hour a week for every Italian school aged child for sustainable citizenship. But it all felt too difficult. And then the opportunity of a private members bill came up and I was lucky. I was number six in the draw um, with my um, education brackets, environment and sustainable citizenship close brackets bill. And that's now been introduced. We've got the second reading uh, next month where we will debate the bill in principle. Um, I've been able to work with Peers for the Planet with Anne Finlayson um, from uh, SEED, Jamie at Teach the Future to put the wording together. And, and, and what, we've, what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the national curriculum. There are currently two core aims of the national curriculum. We're adding a third to instill an ethos and an ability to care for oneself, to care for one others, and to care for the natural env environment for present and future generations. And we're also seeking to change citizenship education into sustainable citizenship education, requiring the Secretary of State to issue guidance on the impact of human behavior on the environment, of the environment on human behavior, uh, and uh, to, to, to develop skills to protect and rest, restore the environment and to measure our impact on the environment. I've also today put in amendments to the skills and further education bill that's currently in parliament so that we can do something for post 16. So 
perhaps a little bit late, I've seen the possibility of using my place in the House of Lords and a legislative programme to sort of jump in and have a go at uh, changing the curriculum. Now, it's a long and rocky road to getting a private member's bill in. We will um, have it debated for the first time, as I say, uh, in July. We will then go into committee stage in the autumn in the Lords. Hopefully we can get it into the Commons by Christmas, and then we will see what kind of a journey it gets uh, in, in the Commons. But we will know by the end of July what the government's stance is on making these changes, which so many people say to me, well, why would anyone object to that? It just seems obvious. And yet we might have opposition. We will have to see. I'm, I'm hopeful, but I have no idea in the end. Which means that if anyone is looking to help, then and you know any members of the House of Lords or members of Parliament that represent you, please get in touch with them and encourage them to support this change to the national curriculum. And although it, you know, academy schools won't, don't have to apply, don't have to abide by the national curriculum, the Secretary of State, Gavin Williamson, is really clear that the national curriculum represents what he expects to be taught in schools. Uh, and it, it represents what he would expect Ofsted to inspect when they go into schools. So I think it is of significance for all schools, even though legally it will only apply to maintain schools. So that's where we're at. We're doing this work as future proofed in the run up to COP. I'll be doing the work in parliament, trying to get change to the curriculum. We're also now thinking about what we do post COP. And I would love to keep talking to you all and engaging. And yeah, I'll be listening to the conversation, Cindy, around what more we can do in the curriculum beyond any legal change but you know clearly there are schools up and down the country who are doing great work working with people like yourself and the others on the panel and how can we amplify that and do more is something that interests me greatly but thank you very much Thank you so much, uh, Jim, for that really powerful work that you're doing there. And, you know, at the heart of the political system, I think that will just that makes the whole um, game so much easier to to change, to, to shift when we have agency of that kind in those um, really um, significant uh, places. So a huge thanks for what you're doing there. Um, now, I, my great pleasure to introduce Steve. Grace, uh, you're working um, from a different place. Uh, Steve is the head of education and outdoor learning at the Royal Geographical Society. And the, the, this role in Steve's role, he provides support for teachers uh, from the local uh, and the doable. So whether it's something that you're working on in your local ecosystem, Moorlands, Pete's, uh, Pete Moorlands or coast, or whether you're taking teachers far away into the rainforest, um, Steve is finding ways for teachers to bring this in to the, the core lives of, of, of people at school, inspired by a very passionate and enthusiastic geography teacher himself. That's what's led him onto this, um, this path. And he's been working with the Royal Geographical Society since 2002. So I'm sure you've got a huge insight for us, Steve, on what is possible in this space, what you've observed in the past and what you see coming up for us in the future. Thanks, Cindy, and also delighted to be joining you people today. Um, I feel I should be speaking from a, a sort of uh, a more than peat bog or a rainforest rather than bunking up in, my, in one of my, my now left home son's bedroom. But I'm just going to share my screen. I've got a couple of slides just to share with colleagues. And hopefully, um, if I make this full screen, it will. Um, can people see the slides just to check on the other side? Yeah, there's thumbs up. That's great. I'm also delighted to uh, to follow Lord Jim Knight as well, and I'll say a few words about some of our, our previous links. So I'm Steve Brace. I'm head of education at the Royal Geographical Society. Geography is my thing. You've got a passionate geographer for the next ten minutes um, or so, and I've just got three or four slides just to illustrate some of the key themes. And this echoes much of what Jim was saying. Actually, of there's important opportunities in the curriculum. I'll be talking about geography. And of course, it's not just about the curriculum, it's about the wider work of the school within a, a broader community and, and the broader setup as well. So um, there's lots of links people can follow up. 
our Jester Org schools is probably the most useful one. And you can follow us um, on Twitter and also follow me and my work at Steve Brace Jog as well. So just a few words about geography, first of all. When I'm asked what's geography, I always say, well, it's about people, human geography. It's about environment, the physical process that change our natural world. It's about places, because what geographers do is bring the spatial context to the interaction between people in the environment, whether it's small scale, neighborhood, town, region, country, or the global scale. It's the interaction of those three that makes things uniquely geographical and the connections between the physical world and the human world. And I think we provide, from a geographical point of view, yes, other subjects make important contributions too. In connecting both across the physical sciences and the social sciences, geography brings this important dimension to the curriculum. It's useful just to also mention who's studying geography. Um, and I do want to say a particular thanks to, to Lord Jim Knight for his work in education almost probably 15 years ago when he was involved with the society in funding the action plan for geography that set the foundations for some of the really positive change that's happened over the last 15 years. We now have just short of 270,000 youngsters studying geography. These are in English schools. There's probably about another five to 10,000 studying geography in Wales and Northern Ireland. That's gone up by almost 100,000 entries over the last 15 years, which is really heartening to see in terms of young people choosing geography as one of their GCSE options. We have about 32,000 or so A-level students. We had a 16% rise this year, and we've seen growing numbers of young people going on to study geography at university as well. So from my point of view, in terms of the subject that provides an important contribution around climate change and sustainability, it's good to see the health of the subject in terms of the growing numbers of youngsters who are studying it. Um, at GCSE, we've seen much greater diversity in terms of the range of students, those from low income backgrounds, those from lower prior attainment, black, Asian, minority, ethnic students taking geography, but we're not yet seeing that carrying through to A-level in university. And it's an important piece of work as at the RGS and the wider geographical community are, are taking on in terms of diversifying the subject at A level and degree. So more young people from more different sorts of backgrounds can gain from studying geography. But when we asked the public, we did a couple of YouGov surveys um, about 18 months ago, one on GCSE, which this slide is showing and one on A level. We asked the public, representative sample of the UK public, which GCSE or A level subjects do you think can really help teach about climate change? And as a geographer, I'm delighted to see geography come head and shoulders above every other subject. Next in line is biology, chemistry, physics, history, and so on. But I think there's an interesting lesson here. I do lots of work with the maths community because there's a big data element to geography. And one of the things I've been saying to maths colleagues, if only 6% of the British public think that maths has really any contribution to climate change, when you think of the computational knowledge, the modeling, the geographers are working with mathematicians in this sector as well. It's an important lesson in terms of maths needing to demonstrate its relevance to this issue as well. So I'm delighted to see the public recognise geography, of course, but there's some important lessons for other contributors across the curriculum as well. Um, there are lots of opportunities and requirements across the geography national curriculum within its GCSEs or in its A-level courses to cover climate, climate change, wider environmental, ecological issues, and so on and so on. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I think one of the important lessons about thinking about the curriculum is also the building blocks that allow young people to have the depth of knowledge to understand these complex issues. So it's important within geography they understand about weather and understand about climate, which is basically a 30 year average of weather, as well as being able to understand how this impacts and is driven by climate change as well. And I think that depth of knowledge is a really important element that the curriculum provides within particular subject areas. Yes, lots of other work should be taking place, but it's that sort of access to the sort of robust authoritative knowledge you get within geography, within other subject areas relevant to this area of work that's really important. And just the last couple of slides, some considerations alongside this curriculum area. As I've said, it's not just the curriculum. There is real work 
in the real world that needs to take place. And here I think geography plays another important role. Uh, you can see a little uh, picture of students on a field studies council course looking like they're in a car park, but actually what they're doing is measuring the, the carbon capacity of trees in their local area. And if you measure at a certain height, the, the uh, circumference of a tree, you know what sort of type it is, you can then determine how much carbon has been sequestrated in your local woods. And this is commonplace now within many geography field works. There's also, and Jim referred to this, the green economy is going to be huge. And as we can see from figures from back in 2018, there's an estimated 42 billion worth of, of value in there. And I'm not sure yet, and I don't mean, mean this as a criticism for very, very busy teachers, but I'm not sure yet the opportunities within the green economy have yet been fully connected with careers education, both within subject areas, when youngsters go, where can geography lead me? And within careers education more broadly, whether you're studying STEM subjects, other arts, humanities subjects as well. And I'm always thinking back to my time as a geography teacher out in West London, when a year nine pupil called Anthony, one never forgets them, asked me, well said to me, there's no point doing geography because I want to. I don't want to be a geography teacher like you, sir. Um, thank you, Anthony. But I think the important lesson in this is most children think that the key job you can do by studying studying a particular subject is often become a teacher. Noble calling though it is, and we need that broader connection with the wider green economy, whether in geography and other subject areas. And we're doing lots of work at the society through our through a series of career profiles called I'm a Geographer, which is highlighting the work of people who've studied geography in a whole range of careers. And we have Isabella, who worked for the World Town Planning Institute doing work around renewable energy. And if you Google that, you can find all that sort of stuff on our website. I think there's also more work. We've just undertaken a big piece of research with 500 young people around this about young people's views on the role of geography to their further study and careers. Uh, sorry, their views on the environment to their career, subject choices and further careers. And we'll be releasing some data on this later in the year. I, I'm afraid I haven't got a teaser on this, but it, we, we get the feeling there's some interesting findings in it. And then finally, just to finish, lots of opportunity to get involved with the society. Every Wednesday, we're running our Be Climate Smart tiles, where we highlight a particular element of climate change and wider environmental themes. We very much hope people might be sharing these and contributing their own. And I'll just leave you with, with this quote from Michael Palin. So Michael Palin, uh, former president of the society, to echo something Jim was saying, what does geography do? It illuminates the past, explains the present, and prepares us for, for the future. It's really important work we do collectively in schools, and what could be more important with that? So I'll finish there. Thank you, folks. I'll stop sharing. Well, thank you so much, uh, Steve. It's just wonderful to see how you're using your subject to break down the silos and to really make clear the interconnections between all the subjects and the role that they have to play in being part of the solutions that we're looking for, as well as taking children out of the school context and, and building these links with the real world. I think that's fascinating. And I also think you've highlighted a really important lever there, which Milani has picked up in the, in the chat. Um, that this link, the opportunity that the green jobs present that Jim has, is so powerfully uh, working with and the lack of link that, that, that there is with that in the schools. I think that will become, that's, that's a, I think it, it's, a, it's a problem at the moment, but it's a huge opportunity to, um, to, to make this much more relevant to young people. So thanks, a huge thanks to you. And now what a delight to introduce Anne Finlayson. Anne, I don't know if you can um, put your video on. Uh, Anne is an absolute powerhouse in this space. We had uh, Jonathan Porritt opening the uh, uh, conference, uh, in one of the opening addresses this morning, who spoke uh, to the work or the importance of the work that you have been doing and you have done uh, with the UK Sustainable Development Commission and uh, joined WWF UK in 2000 and became its head of education and then went on to become the education commissioner and capability builder for the UK uh, Sustainable Development Commission which I'm sure you're going to speak to us a little bit about that, Anne, so I'll, I'll park that one there. But 
undaunted and has gone on to create Seed in 2009, which is probably you know, one of the most um, earliest established and most broadly connected um, organizations that, to, to, that enables schools to engage with this agenda. So Anne's been doing incredibly powerful work and delighted that you're gonna tell us more about it, Anne. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cindy. It's so nice to see you again, and Jim. Um, and others, it's like a massive reunion. Um, anyway, um, I have been asked to talk about a holistic approach to a curriculum for education for sustainable de development. And it turns out I do know how to talk about this. Um, I did have a slight worry, but I do. Um, and the first point I really want to make is that um, the national curriculum is not statutory, um, although Ofsted do inspect for it. Um, but one of the big things that you know we have discovered over the years is that schools often say um, we can't do this because we have no mandate to do it and so getting this into the education act is a massive step forward and really delighted to be helping bill bill jim jim on his bill i knew i was going to do that um at seed but also with our shared world which is this massive coalition and Jim, we are lined up 130 organizations to support you um, in any way that we can. And we've got them all geared up, ready to go. Um, so a holistic approach to a, a curriculum for ESD. If we get this mandate, great. So what do we do then as educators? How do we do it? How do we create that holistic approach? I'm gonna be a bit controversial here. This is not about the pupils. This is about schools and it's about teachers and it's about change. And it's not about behavior change of the students, but change in our practice. And I'm saying our, because I don't just mean educators in schools, but I mean educators who support schools. And as Steve said, and, and Jim has outlined, there is loads of evidence to say that young people, you know, get this stuff, they, they know about it, they know it's a massive issue, it's an existential crisis. Um, but two things I think are really important to note. Firstly, the OECD had a fantastic um, uh, report called Green at 15, which is really worth looking at. And what it basically shows in the countries that they looked at was that those countries that had scored very highly, apart from Finland, of course, which is always the exception, um, very highly in the PISA scores, had the lowest levels of student sense of agency around making a difference for a sustainable world. Singapore was 20% of students felt they had some agency. Oh, that's appalling. Secondly, the SEED surveys show that young people do learn about you know, their stuff, this stuff in geography and science, but they also learn it in other places. And when we ask them, what do you want to learn in school? They say they want to learn how to live sustainably. They don't wanna learn the content, of climate change, they want to learn how to live sustainably. And I can hear yes buts. But um, I don't know how to live sustainably. Well, none of us do. We all are trying. So what it means is we are learning how to live sustainably. And that is something I think we need to reflect back to students and actually take in to our uh, psyche and our mindset about how we are as teachers. And there's some other yes buts. Uh, and I'm saying yes, but because if you don't uh, know the cycle of change by Proclaster and De Clementi, I would recommend you go and Google it um, because it really helps you try to move forward from what is seen as barriers. So what are the yes, buts I hear? No time, no space in the curriculum, no money, no training. And I would agree with all of those. But the way to get over this if you, if you look at uh, De Clementi and Procaster's work, is to start somewhere, is to take some action. And here are some ideas. Idea number one, do a school audit. So this conference is all about campus curriculum and community, which is part of a whole school approach uh, that's been around since the Labour government um, for the Sustainable Schools Initiative. Um, at SEED, we've been working uh, for the last six years with UNESCO on a more generalized uh, generic model, which covers governance and, and reflects on what you do at school um, in every way that you do it, not just um, a teacher with kids in front of you. So first of all, 
think about what you do in the school. Um, and there will be things going on. It'll be really surprising what's going on. But then ask yourself some critical thinking questions. What is the learning outcome or the learning experiences that you are promoting to your students? And what do you think is going to happen as a result of those experiences and learning outcomes? Is it all activity based? Is it an add on? Ofsted found that in three research reports they did in the early 2000s that it was often an add on. Uh, and I'm going to share at the end of you uh, that the, they've sent in, in the chat some links to the whole institution approach. And these tools are free on seed to help you get your way through this and ask yourself some critical thinking questions. But I bet you've started somewhere. So then let's start talk about, you know, some other critical thinking questions that you should ask yourself as a practitioner. And idea number two is, do you teach about stuff or things? And this is not what you're expecting, I know, and it's not a framework, but it's a series of questions. And this comes from Fridjof Capra. And those of you who don't know who he is, he was a theoretical physicist. Um, and this is the book, Ecological Literacy. It looks back to front on my screen, but hopefully it's the right way for, for you. And I'd like to quote him. He says, thinking in complex systems is now at the very forefront of science. It's also part of ancient thinking, enabled traditional peoples to sustain themselves for thousands of years. It has still not taken hold in our mainstream culture. And I would count education as part of that. I've thought quite, he's thought quite a lot about why people find systems thinking so difficult. And he's concluded two main reasons. One is living systems are non-linear, they're networks. And our whole scientific tradition is based on linear thinking, cause, and effect. In linear thinking, when something works, more of the same will always be better. For instance, a healthy economy, is what people think, will show strong, indefinite economic growth. But successful living systems are highly non-linear. They don't maximize their variables, they optimize them. When something is good, more of the same will not necessarily be better, because things go in cycles, not along straight lines. The point is not to be efficient, but to be sustainable. So how do you do that in your teaching? You don't need a framework. You don't need uh, someone to come in and give you a whole new curriculum. You need to think about what you do. So do you teach about stuff or things? And here's how to reflect on it. Can you move from the knowledge to contextualizing that knowledge? And I know geography teachers do that. I'm an ex-geography teacher and maths teacher, and I did it in maths as well. Can you move from the content of the curriculum to patterns? Can you move from learning about objects to relationships? Idea number three, do you demonstrate and explore cycles and flow? Because these are crucial. What we're talking about here is sustainability thinking and ecological thinking and how all living systems, including human systems work. Energy flows, matter flows, money flows, material flows, people flow, information flows. You know, and if you're a primary school and you get your kids to write a letter to their MP, do you think about that flow of um, information and where it goes and how, how it works within a parliamentary system? And if I can encourage you to read one book, it would be Sense and Sustainability, uh, which you can get from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And it really looks at systems thinking. Idea number four, do you present knowledge as static or do you demonstrate change over time or change or diversity in cultures? Because that will tell you about the different conditions, which often leads to understanding diversity. And the reason I'm saying this is a vital thing is I taught theory of knowledge in the IB for two years and it transformed my teaching. Idea number five, if you have done the audit, are you reflecting, sorry, repeating activities or knowledge? Um, this is a very common characteristic in schools where things get repeated year after year after year. Um, when I was teaching, it turned out that five classes were teaching the water cycle when we got inspected. Um, they wondered if there was anything else we were, in, we were doing. Um, there can be some unintended consequences of repeating activities. And the reason I'm saying this is I met um, a range of um, head, meet head teachers in Essex 
who said to me, Anne, we seem to do the same sustainability thing every year, uh, mostly in July. And, uh, you know, so we turn off lights, we do, a, you know, uh, that campaign, or we do a litter pick, uh, or we plant some vegetables. Um, those are okay, that they're add-ons, but they can have an unintended consequence. And this is what happened at Plymouth University. They interviewed thousands of their undergraduates and postgraduates about an energy uh, literacy survey. And they asked them what was the one thing that each of them could do to uh, save energy. And they all, all without fail said, turn off lights. And that isn't the case in the UK. The thing in the UK that we can all do is turn down the heating or not fly. And why did they say that? Plymouth thought they'd failed, but they said that because of the repeated activity in school after school, year after year of running campaigns to turn off lights. And what you end up telling people is that's more important than anything else. You haven't said it intentionally, but you have it, impl you've implied it. Idea number six. This is the one I get all the time. And I spoke with seven schools in Cambridge and they kept saying, but we're not experts and we can't be perfect at a sustainable school. You don't need to be. A sustainable school is not a perfect sustainable um, example. It's a learning institution. You are modeling learning for sustainability and that will give your students agency and build resilience. And lastly, idea number seven. You absolutely need to understand change. You need to challenge yourself whether you understand change, whether you think you understand it. And this is what I, this is your homework. You can tell I'm an ex-teacher. This is your homework. Um, this is an activity I've done many, many times with people. And I ask them if they think their job is about change. And many people say their job in education is about change. So, okay, so let's explore change. I want you to think about a time when you changed your mind. And I want you, we're not gonna do it now because it, you know, and certainly don't do it in Ireland because it takes 45 minutes. Um, but think about change when you change your mind, um, a moment. Think about where you were, who you were with, what triggered it and what happened next. I did this with outdoor educators in Winchester about 10 years ago as a keynote on the first day. They talked about it for four days because they honestly thought that it would be in a classroom uh, or outdoors with a teacher. And I have almost never, in hundreds of times I've done that activity, got anyone to say that it was in a classroom in front of a teacher. It is when we work collaboratively or when we're with people and it's a social situation, that's what makes us change. So a holistic approach to a curriculum for ESD is change and us. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, um, Anne. You know, a really wonderful call for us to think systemically and to enable our emerging generations to, to do that as well. It's, it's clearly the key ecological thinking. Um, and on the subject of thinking, it's wonderful to introduce Caroline, Caroline Hickman, who is the, um, who's coming to us today from the Climate Psychology Association and is looking at the psychological effects of climate catastrophe, of eco-anxiety, of social collapse. Um, Caroline is a teaching fellow and she has a background in social work. She's currently a PhD candidate in education at the University of Bath with a particular focus on researching children's relationship with nature and feelings about climate change. So really fantastic to have you with us, Caroline, and to hear from this dimension of how we can shift how we how we teach thank you well, thank you so much for inviting me i'm going to try and share my screen for a moment let's see if we can get this to work <laughs> so nearly there we go. Is that working okay? You got the, can you see it okay? Excellent, right. So thank you so much. So I'm going to um, make a argument for 
teaching about feelings, emotional resilience, emotional intelligence in the curriculum. Uh, because I'm going to argue that feelings are central to us addressing climate change. But I'm going to be very much presenting a depth psychology approach, which includes the unconscious. And why do we need this? Well, we need to understand why we defend against climate change, why we defend against the feelings. We've, we've had solutions for decades to the climate and biological crisis and not acted. And of course, we can have economic, practical, scientific, political arguments about why not? But we can also have a psychological argument about why not? And if we can understand better how we feel and how children feel and what and why and then process those feelings, it'll give us an understanding which will lead to meaning. Then we can start a transformative process, um, turning eco-anxiety, distress, fear, paralysis, anxiety into awareness, compassion, empathy, action, activism. We need to step towards these difficult feelings, not away from them. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, can I just briefly start with the numbers? The 2020 YouGov poll with Friends of the Earth found 70% of 18 to 24 year olds were more worried than in 2019. So that's important. It was during COVID and they were still more worried about climate change. Global Action Plan research found 77% of students were anxious. The Royal College of Psychiatry numbers from 2020, over half of child and adolescent psychiatrists are now seeing children and young people who are distressed about climate change. I'm a psychotherapist and in my psychotherapy practice, half my psychotherapy practice is now made up of children, young people and adults who are terrified of climate change. The UN Development Programme and Oxford University research from 2021 looked 1.2 million people in 50 countries, half a million of which were under 18. 70% of them said climate change is a global emergency. So we're talking large numbers. We're talking enormous figures here. Um, but it's a dilemma, isn't it? It's a huge dilemma. How do we talk to children and young people and adults, you might be thinking out there right now, about the crisis, the emergency that we're in, without either splitting into the binary, terrifying people, or minimizing it, because both are an attempt to escape from uncertainty and vulnerability. It's infinitely worse for children if we don't talk to them about the realities of what we're facing. The impact on their mental health is significant. And what it also damages is their relationships with trusted adults. So it's absolutely significant. When I started my research with children, 10 years ago, I spoke to a lot of children about how do we do this research with you without terrifying you? And I'm going to quote Sophia. I have to use her name. Uh, she said, well, she said she was 10. She said, you've got to tell us the truth, because if you're not telling us the truth, you're lying to us. And if you're lying to us, we can't trust you. And if we can't trust you, we can't tell you how we feel. She said, and then we'd be on our own. She said, but don't tell me all the bad stuff all at once. Tell me some good stuff and some bad stuff. Then some good stuff, then some bad stuff. She said, anyway, she said, I'm not a baby. I love this child. I wish she was running the world. Children are often very aware. They're online. They are connected. They're talking to each other. We often don't know how much they know. Schools are crucial in navigating this, about how to communicate this and model how to communicate this and integrate emotional intelligence into the curriculum. If we don't, children feel this as a betrayal and as an abandonment, they feel hurt. Children's experience of this distress is very different to that of adults. They have different defenses. Adults can rationalize far better than children. For children, it's not just the environmental degradation and destruction that is upsetting to them. It's the failure of adults to take action. And that instills this sense of powerlessness and helplessness in children and anger and frustration. We might not always know how they feel about this. They'll often take their lead from us in talking to us about how they feel. One research interview three years ago, I turned up at the family's house just before Christmas and the father met me at the door saying, I don't think he knows much about climate change. I don't think he's 
going to be able to tell you very much at all. I said, OK, we'll see. And I encouraged parents to stay in the room and, and listen in. After a few minutes, the child was saying to me, this is a 10-year-old boy, he was saying, oh, climate change is like a crocodile and it's the size of a continent and it's crawling across the face of the earth and it's eating and it's eating and it's consuming and it's rotting from the inside out and its scales are falling off and it, its hunger will never be satisfied. Well, this child perfectly embodied the kind of systemic, global understanding of climate change and the destruction, the relational destruction. The father was traumatized. The child was really relishing having the opportunity to talk symbolically about how he was feeling about this. Children are feeling sad, angry, frustrated, anxious, often shut down. They can appear indifferent and they can appear as though they're nihilistic. It's like, well, what's the point? Or bored. But that's a defense. That's a defense because it is terrifying. Now, this is also also on a scale. So what I'm finding is we've got significant numbers of children where the anxiety and distress is mild, where reassurance works. But there are also significant numbers of children and young people where it is severe distress. I'm working as a therapist with young people who are suicidal. A 19 year old said to me, tell me why I should want to live in a world that doesn't care about children, doesn't take action to show that you care. So we have to keep in mind that there can be severe distress, there can be severe mental health problems developing through this at the moment. The defences are very, very different in children and young people. They haven't been, the majority, I'm generalising, I do apologise, but they've not learnt that life is unfair and they've not learnt how to navigate that unfairness quite often. There's also a profound attachment to nature and to this idea that the, that the world should clearly do what is sensible and right, which is take action on climate change. And what this is causing often in children and young people is what Sally Weintraub has described in her new book as a moral injury, which is a failure to do what's right. And this is perceived as governments, people in power, adults, teachers, failing to do what's right. This is hard for us. So let's be empathic to us. How do we deal with how this feels? Well, we can simplify this. We can other children, treat children as though they were different to us or different creatures. We can minimize, we can deny, we can personalize. We can really struggle with the balance that we need to achieve. And it's understandable because we're scared too. We need a very child-focused approach to this, but a child-focused approach that understands how this feels from the perspective of a child a few years ago, a, a 10 year old was shouting at me. He said, Caroline, you don't get it. You don't understand. He said, you grew up in a world expecting polar bears to be there forever. He said, I have grown up knowing that polar bears will go extinct. You need to know how that feels. It's different for me. It's different for children. And he was right. So we have to have a relational approach to this, which has an intergenerational empathy and understanding how we as adults may perceive this may not be how children perceive this. And one of the ways to resolve this is to say sorry. We have to say sorry without emotional collapse. We have to model grief, regret, fear, sadness, and say sorry and show children that it's okay to not feel okay. And we're not going to collapse emotionally or start blaming people. This is about how we model this emotional intelligence. I genuinely think this needs to be built into the curriculum. We need to be teaching people this because then we can show people how to navigate these feelings. Take eco-anxiety and turn it into eco-action, eco-community, eco-care. If we need a reminder about why, let me tell you what another child said to me. A 14-year-old in the Maldives said to me, we saw online that people in Iceland had a funeral for a glacier. This is a lovely thing, he said, but we're going to be underwater soon. Who's going to have a funeral for us? Another child in the Maldives said to me, climate change is like Thanos in the Avengers Endgame, whose ideology is to kill off half of life in the universe so the other half can thrive. He said, the trouble is, he said, we're the half being killed off. It's the children who are being killed off. Children are looking at this fully in the face. So we need to be alongside them in doing that. 
I'm going to leave you with some more positive, solution-focused approaches. So we need to be teaching empathy, wisdom, global injustice, thoughts, feelings, action in the curriculum. This is an opportunity to teach children about feelings, which in turn will have a huge impact on their mental health generally. I sat in a park in the West Country a few years ago, pre-COVID, of course, and I asked children, a group of children I was working with, what do you need from education to help you for the future? These are children who are very aware of climate change, mixed ages. They said, well, we need lessons in boat building. We need to know which plants we can grow, which plants we can eat, how to grow vegetables. But we also need lessons in storytelling because we need to create new stories for the future. The old stories won't help us. We also want lessons in how to have difficult conversations with adults and parents. And we need lessons in how to lobby politicians. So I think these children really were showing us very much what was needed. I just want to show you how we integrated. And it's sorry to interrupt, Caroline. I just have I to be a bit um, conscious of time. So please just bring I'll that. I'll wind up, but I just want to leave you with something sorry. very, very positive. I'm sorry. I could talk forever. No, 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 please finish what, um, what you're... Super quick now. So this is some practical solutions about bringing emotionality into the curriculum. We made puppets and got the puppets to communicate with each other about climate change. And we worked with a group of primary school children, teaching them about the impact of climate change on whales. And we got them drawing whales and we got them measuring whales and doing maths on whales. And then we talked about the extinction, how whales draw carbon from the atmosphere, but also the extinction of whales and the damage. And then we grew a whale in their school playing field. And we looked at how their relationship with whales changed. We planted two and a half thousand crocus bowls in the shape of a baby humpback whale on their playing field. And from this, we were able to teach children about extinction, annihilation, fear, trauma, terror, and it changed their relationship and it changed their relationship and understanding with climate change and they recognized their own vulnerability as well as that of the planet. Thanks so much, uh, Caroline. I can't imagine the emotional energy that it must take to hold that sense of paralysis that you speak about, uh, that, that children have, and, and as you say, that the moral injury that, they, they, that, that, they, that they're suffering. So I hope that your work it will be a major thread of what everybody here is doing so that that we can actually be equip children and equip ourselves to to tell the truth and behave in a way that makes that uh, something that we can actually hold and, and and cope with so thank you very much for, for, for the work that you do and um now it's with great pleasure that i introduced b b harrison um B's a 16 year old climate activist and she's um, based in South London. She's part of the team at Teach the Future who are doing astonishing work. I don't need to, 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 to tell anybody here about the power of Teach the Future. Uh, B started activism in school, initi initiating a climate council for the school and worked on brilliant projects like Brand New You, which actually is a weekly exposure on major brands and unethical practices, which is a superb way of, of reaching um, young people and also provided alternatives to, it's not, it's not just you can't have, but you can have something much, much, much better instead. And so um, B believes that it is key for school to act as support systems for enabling students to realize their potential and become change makers on the local, regional, and even global scale. And here you are B proving that with support that is utterly possible. So thank you very, very much for joining. Thank you so much for that introduction. So, hi, um, I'm B. I'm 16 and I've just finished my GCSEs and as said previously I'm based in South East London in Greenwich and I'm talking to you today on behalf of an organisation called Teach the Future but before I get into that I would like to quickly provide some context on how I got involved in the youth climate activism movement. I've always been somewhat environmentally conscious and from a very early age I can remember thinking gosh that sounds like something we need to find a solution for. 
Whenever the despairing WWF adverts for polar bears appeared on TV, depicting ridiculously fluffy and all the more saddening cubs flailing about on whatever in whatever was left of their little frozen ha habitat. However, as I grew older, I began to feel more and more what can only be described as anxious when it came to the climate crisis. This climate anxiety and guilt spiraled into a full-blown eating disorder, refusing to eat anything to compensate for the emissions of everyone else's food. It was logical and irrational, I know, but it was the only way that I, for some reason at that point, felt I could make a difference. One of the only ways I persuaded myself to recover was the fact that my dad threatened to sit outside the, Maud the Maudsley inpatient center, idling in his car until I was discharged. I will never forget that sense of helplessness. And I'm now on a mission to emphasize the point that, cl that the climate crisis is also much, sorry, is also a social and a mental health crisis. This session's objective is on curricular reform in relation to the latest science and understanding child psychology. With this in mind, a survey by the environmental charity Global Action Plan revealed one in three teachers are seeing high levels of climate anxiety in students. While just over three quarters of students say that thinking about climate change makes them anxious. So please, this is one of my first messages, understand this. In this age of readily available information, we must educate our youth with truthful or realistic, albeit sometimes terrifying facts, also optimism and support. There may be a fine line between optimism, optimism and naivety, but educators have a duty of care to prepare students for their future. And what good would it be if the next generation can argue how Lady Macbeth is a transgressive char character or memorize all eight circle theorems but are oblivious to how they can mitigate, to put it bluntly, an extinction event. Conveying the urgency of this issue can be empowering if relayed responsibly. As a result, youth will be confident and able to drive the change, but not everyone has to be the next Greta Thunberg. I started off just establishing Climate Council at my secondary school before I began wider reaching work. The climate movement is for everyone in every sense. Everyone can contribute to collective change and everyone will reap those benefits. Therefore, Teach the Future was first established in 2019 and is a youth-led UK-wide organisation made up of 100 volunteers. However, I joined in November of 2020 and we campaign for climate action, education and justice in the political realm, as well as supporting grassroots community projects. We have three main asks. One, to teach students about climate change. As simple as this may sound, we discovered as a result of a research project that we funded, that only 4% of students feel that they have been taught sufficiently about climate education. And 70% of teachers feel unable to accurately teach climate education. This needs to change. If we are to achieve the societal lifestyle shift required, and people must understand how they can contribute to the solution on an individual level and be empowered to rally against institutional obstinacy. Education is the only way to close the knowledge gap between our actions and our consequences. Two, include green skills in many vocational courses. The UK needs a workforce able to bring us net zero emissions and make world leaders in sustainable technologies. Therefore, vocational courses need to include the green skills required to achieve this. And three, make educational buildings climate friendly. Our educational buildings play an essential role in how and what we learn. By retrofitting them to net zero emissions by 2030, we can, re we can create green jobs across the country and inspire students to live sustainably. We have calculated the cost of retrofitting all England educational buildings to be 23 billion pounds. However, in the most recent up update of the Skills and Jobs White Paper, only one and a half billion pounds was proposed to be spent on improving further educational buildings with no mention of carbon neutrality or sustainable building principles in all 80 pages. Overarching this, we have a policy we like to call 
of the golden thread. The idea that climate education must be implemented to a sufficient degree in every single subject and not just siloed into geography and the sciences. Because not everyone wants to be a climate scientist and yet the climate crisis will affect every single one of us. Moreover, as a GCSE geography student, you would be proud of me, Steve. Um, I can say that from experience that the force feeding of seemingly endless statistics isn't always the most effective approach to learning. Whilst the numbers can provide context, discovering and exploring localized personal stories in other subjects, such as English, drama, photography, and dance, can improve the previously mentioned human aspect of the climate crisis to life. Just imagine, it's the last period on a Friday, it's incredibly hot and stuffy in this classroom, the scent of sweaty post PE year seven still lingers in the air, and of course the air conditioning is broken. Now, if these students were just recounted a list of numbers depicting the 52% decline in biodiversity, or the fact that in December 2020, global emissions were 2% higher than that of December 2019, do you think they would care? Maybe. But if instead they learnt the story of Ella Kissy Deborah, whose, dead was ruled, whose death was ruled to be as a result of her severe asthma exasperated by illegally high pollution levels in South London, that would hit home. That would stir emotions and ignite a desire, ignite a desire for change. Many world leaders speak of a green economy. But how will the next generation of workers support this ideal if they are not equipped with an appropriate understanding of how their sector contributes to the solution? If it doesn't, and if it doesn't, how those consequences will affect them. So you might be thinking, what are we doing about it? Well, unlike some policymakers, Teach the Future doesn't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. Uh, in early 2020, we held a political response reception at the Houses of Parliament to which over 50 MPs intended, attended and where we stated our case the need of climate education reform and earlier this year we submitted our draft English edu Climate Education Act, the first ever education, education act to be written by youth. It argues that preparing our generation and those to follow with the necessary knowledge and understanding of the climate emergency and socio-ecological crisis and ensuring that we have the skills and resilience to adapt is fundamental and should be as important as numeracy and literacy. One of our major upcoming projects is an English education review. We have contacted the Department of Education 18 times, asking for a review of what is being done, but more importantly, what needs to be done in climate education. However, every time we have been ignored or given an insufficient answer, so we are now receiving grants um, by organisations such as the Rita Howard Foundation to fund our own English education review that hopefully we will start sometime later this year. If you'd like to see more of what we've done in our campaign, Campaign, such as our coordinated week of action, um, then please visit our website or follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Those details will hopefully be posted in the chat shortly. And finally, how can you help? One thing to do is check out our petition to ask the government to implement broad climate education on our website and join the over 25,000 others who have signed this. You can also easily ask your elected representatives if they support climate education using our pre-filled form. And thank you very much for listening. And I can't wait to see if I can answer any questions later on. Thanks so much, B. That was a, a wonderful um, presentation of what you, you do. And thanks also sh for sharing your own quite well, very harrowing story, really. But that it's, it, it's so inspiring that you've turned it into some, something that is so distressing, into something so positive. And I, I love the clarity with which what you have, you know, what you've asked for, truthfulness, realism. It is terrifying, but with optimism and support, we can make that into something that leads to um, building change. So I, I really appreciate that. And some wonderful comments coming through for Rachel Moosin at Thoughtbox about how vital the work that Teach the Future is doing and that, that clarity around triple well-being, emotional, environmental, and social well-being, which you've articulated um, so well. Um, well, 
to close the session, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Kath Prisk. Uh, Kath is the director of Outdoor People and uh, she's passionate about connecting young people and children to the outdoors. So I'm sure that so much of this has been resonating with you, uh, Kath, around the staticness of a system that locks children in rooms. And Kath is adamant that we can, uh, by physically connecting to children outdoors, we can actually start to shift uh, the system, how we educate people. Um, everybody has a stake in ensuring children have a great childhood, from transport planners to schools to parents to the media. And Kath is a consultant. She works through her own social en enterprise as a board member of the Wild Networks, all of this focusing on making that connection between getting outdoors and shifting how we think about nature, how we think about our world and how we think about our curriculum. So delighted to, um, to have you with us, Kath. Thank you, Cindy. Um, can I just check, can you hear me okay? Is that a yes, we can. Thumbs yeah. up. Yes, good, because I'm using a different microphone because um, I'm, I'm here in Bath and looking out at some lovely green spaces um, out this window. And it's been great to hear all of you so passionate about what we need to teach children. And I'm gonna talk about stopping teaching them and instead enabling them to experience the outdoors. Um, can I just check, can you, can you see that? Can somebody say, tell me verbally, you can see, see my screen. We yes, can. we can see your screen, uh, Kath, it looks brilliant. Excellent. Climate change by stealth then. So how do we make sure that children actually give a hoot, that they want to protect the planet? How do we make sure that children have the, the wherewithal and the, the, the skills within themselves to cope with constant change? How do we ensure that they can feel safe and grounded and like they're coming from a position of strength. How do we make sure they feel trusted in this beautiful, amazing, magical universe that we live in? Bring back play. Play in school, play in their lives, play in their community. I'm here, so as, 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 as was introduced, I'm, I'm Kath Crisk. I'm from Outdoor People. Um, we are a social enterprise. We're based in Hackney in East London. We work worldwide um, supporting this mission idea that children just should be reconnected outdoors. And we build community within um, spaces and places, within schools, within families, around the ideas that going outdoors is simply as important as a good night's sleep, as good quality food, in lots of ways more important than a core education. You can survive without knowing Pythagoras' theorem. I'm not sure we can survive so well if you don't know the smell of petrichor, that scent that you get when it's been raining. Um, I'm currently doing a, a project with Nature for All, um, one of the world's, it's, it's a global campaign supporting um, everybody to connect to nature, sponsored by the IUCN. They did a big piece of research a few years ago, um, a literature review, and consistently, after evidence after evidence, literature review after literature, a piece of academic research after academic research shows that there are two things that children need to develop a love, understanding, care for the environment. They need plenty of time outside, plenty of time regularly in the same place outdoors, and they need role models, positive role models. They don't need to be taught, they need to be heard. As Jim Knight said before, we need to listen. Ten years ago, in 2011, Tim Gill did this great piece of work for London, sowing the seeds. And the key point that came out was that children need playful interventions. They need to just be given time to be outdoors, not constantly taught about the outdoors. So we pulled together as part of the London National Park City that we became um, a couple of years ago. We want London to be greener, healthier, wilder. Um, so myself and a number of others that work with schools across the capital built uh, the London National Park City Schools Network. 13% of London's children 
according to the monitoring engagement of the natural environment report showed that said that they never go to a green space 24 percent only go like less than once a month but 20 percent go every day and that's great london's half green it's like 48 percent green it is not just sad that these kids aren't really spending tons of time outdoors in their own environment in the streets next to their house in the schoolyards in the on the way to and from school it's a tragedy and why is it a tragedy it's a tragedy because if you don't experience things you can't know it being outdoors is important for sort of three key reasons firstly you love it secondly you not then know that when you're having a bad day, you're having a big grump, whether it's about, oh my God, the polar bears are dying, or it's about, oh my God, my mum is driving me insane. You know that you just need to walk outside, touch a tree, smell the fresh air, and you will feel better. Um, what stops children getting outdoors? And by children, I mean all children, up zero to 18. Traffic, big one. Clothing. I did a small survey in Hackney. 45% of mums didn't own a raincoat. Um, fear. Fear of strangers. Fear of um, being bitten. Fear of just not knowing what's going outside. But a lot of it is inside our heads. It's not for people like me. It's something that we've heard. It's a whole nother conversation. Say they don't know where to go. They don't know who to go with. Expectation schools don't emphasize that simply being outdoors is a high priority they don't value it they don't tell children this is a valuable thing to do not just to take them outside for like one or two lessons but as constant i'm going to talk to you now about three key programs that can help your school to prioritize the outdoors firstly outdoor classroom day it's a global campaign it's been going since 2011 um that campaign over the last six years, we saw 63% of the schools that got involved increasing their playtime. 62% increased the amount of time they take children out for lessons. Um, Outdoorclassroomday.com, come and get involved. It's a simple step that means twice a year get involved in a little campaign, big campaign. So over 10 and a half million children have got involved so far. Secondly, and this I'm focusing on, playtime. If children's time to just be outdoors, to wander to school, to come home and have kickabouts until the sun goes down, um, to explore outside of school, if that time has been constrained, and it has, school is where the children are, and 20% of their school life is made up of playtime, of time outside, and that time is valuable. Um, I'm an OPAL mentor, an outdoor play and learning program mentor. Uh, we have hundreds of schools across the UK and worldwide, helping them to make their play times amazing. Giving children time not just to be taught what are the daisies like, how do you um, forage? Great skills, really good to learn, but children need lots of time to make potions and to make me a cup of tea and to sense the different smells in their own environment, be allowed to touch it, to feel it, to be part of it. They need time to get muddy. This is a South London school. This is not somewhere in the middle of Scotland or somewhere leafy. And this is just a South London school that converted a tiny bit of its small green space to a big mud pit where the children have shovels, they have digging equipment, they can just be every lunchtime. Where they can just create and touch and smell and they can either do it on their own if they're feeling stressed they can really help the gut if they just want to pretend to garden they can do that of course they can do some gardening as well they can get involved in all sorts of other things they can spend time actually making stuff they have fires but it's also about recycling about understanding second life and stuff and second life doesn't just have to be about um, recycling stuff that I can't quite conceive this plastic bottle might become something else no it can also become a rocket and a spaceship and um, a way of hearing things and, and, and a flying machine and a place that I can hide under and a million things 
these children that have this day in, day out, day in, day out, throughout their primary school, they are more articulate, they are more able to talk about how materials are utilised, and they care. OPAL works with schools to support a strategic approach to transforming playtime so that teachers stop saying stop, stop saying no, and start to say, how can we enable children to get on with just playing? For a hundred thousand years, we as a human species have developed the perfect mechanism to enable schooling infants to grow up into flexible neuroplastic um, change agents. And we have spent the last 60 years stopping them playing. Play is how animals and creatures actually learn to understand who am I as a human being now, not filling them up with information for some future date. Who am I now? Who, where am I now? How do I engage with this environment? How do I deal with the big emotions that are inside me? How do I understand the near and the far and the distant and the, uh, and the togetherness? That's how they learn about the world. You cannot teach somebody anything. You can only enable them to learn. And how do we create the time, space and permission for the children to simply learn about who they are? Beyond the school day, out of people, one of the things we set up when we, we set up six years ago was wild walks of adventures for children to take their parents, their adults, their immediate friends on. And we developed little um, walks around Hackney with the prime goal, we say it's free to point of use, come along. Your only commitment is after you've done this walk, you've got to take a friend and they do. And we are shifting the behavior of families who come along and say, oh, I used to just go to the park for a treat when they've been really good. If they got like an award at the end of school, I'd like maybe take them to the park as a treat. And now I make sure they go every day. Schools, you have a responsibility to tell parents that that maths homework is of course important, but going for a walk, letting your kids simply get dirty, be outside, breathe the fresh air. It's not only going to be good for them, it'll be good for you too. Um, got to have a little plug for my event. Uh, we as London National Park City Schools Network are hosting a teach meet for teachers to get together and talk to each other about how we can make this change. We're going to hear from some great schools, including ones that have improved playtime, but also have touched on all the curriculum deep dive issues that we've talked about in this session. And uh, that QR code will get you in. Um, Let's to the future. I'm finished. That's it. I'm sorry. So <laughs> I can't much. see the timer. Yeah, Thank well, you. we've all run so, but it's absolutely beautiful presentation. And I think you, you just speak to, to, to all of our hearts there. It's, 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 it's soul destroying to see young people locked up, incarcerated, and with with such a narrow sense of what learning is. So that that lovely clarion call to experiential learning and to using nature, whether you're in an urban environment or whether you're in the country as a classroom, it, you know, we couldn't agree with you more and it's just wonderful to hear your passion uh, behind that. Um, we have all slightly run over on our uh, talks but we have got a good eight minutes left for, for questions and answers. It was just such lovely stuff that everybody's sharing so it felt really worthwhile while we have such expertise in the in the room to uh, to really try to max you know to, to hear from you so I hope uh, people aren't disappointed that we have slightly less time for Q&A. Um, uh, it's uh, we, we have some questions in in the chat. We have some wonderful um, things in the in the in the thread. Uh, I invite any of the participants you know to keep those coming through. I'm going to start with a, a question from the wonderful Jess Tipton, who will be uh, speaking later. Um, do we think that there's scope for a recognised secondary sustainability qualification assessed in various ways, with a focus both on knowledge and skills that has a wide uptake and would be accessible to any student? in the UK and around the world. Now I'll throw that out to the panel. Is there anybody who would like to, to go first on that one? I, actually, I'm going to, to be, I'm gonna ask you to go first on that one. What do you think of a recognized qualification in sustainability? 
I, I agree that to some extent it would be good to provide an incentive because I know many students my age, they, they, they're thinking about university and think, oh, what can I put on my CV and things like that. So, yeah, I do agree that it could almost be something like the D of E, the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, however, I think we would have to assess accessibility because obviously not all schools have the funding to be able to support this, but and I don't know, I feel, I feel as though students should engage with sustainability, not because they want an award and they want to feel good about themselves, but because they understand how it would benefit the whole community. But I think it definitely is a good step in the right direction to consider engaging um, young people like that. Thanks, B. The lovely, clear answer. And what, what, what are your thoughts? Um, no, <laughs> Jess, I don't. Sorry, I'm just going to be blunt here. Um, I blame my half Germanness on that, um, and I, I'll explain why. Um, there is a there's a move to get a GCSE in natural history, which is. Um, been pushed forward and is sitting at the Department of Education at the moment and has been for some time. Um, and, and people are very you know, excited about that. I, I think that I think accessibility B is really important. I think it's every child's right. And I think if you make it, you know, uh, the problem is if you make it a qualification or a reward, it becomes a subject. And it's not a subject. It's about how we live and how we think about living and how we are together. Um, and you cannot do sustainability without collaborating. You know, I've been, um, I've been railing against the idea of sustainability champions in schools for a long time. I was one, and that's why I'm saying this, because I got burnt out after four years and I watched other people say, oh, Anne will do that, um, and not doing it themselves. It is core to who we are and who we need to be. Mm -hmm. And I think a qualification is you know it'll be a tick box and everyone will say yeah but we've done that mm. but we won't have done it because as B says it won't be accessible all the way through a child's life from you know uh, reception all the way through to 18 that's what's important you can clearly see that both the, the sides of you that I'm going to move on to the next question and open it up to the um to the, the rest of the panel there just stop because of our shortness of time um it's an it, and it relates very much to what you're saying Anne, which is i'd like no i'd like to share it's it's a question from from rachel mooson what advice would you give a lone wolf teacher or student who is feeling alone in their awareness of the work that needs to happen in schools and are not necessarily supported in their school so you know very much from what you were just saying there about that the burnout that happens when you're carrying this torch on your own Perhaps, oh, Kath, and, and I'm sure Caroline, you'll have something wonderful to say about this as well. So, Hi, can, uh, so when I um, got, first got involved, I was Global Director for Actual Classroom Day for five years, and I remember the, analysing the first year's worth of, of data um, sort of six years ago, and there was you know, thousands and thousands of teachers had written down um, what kind of school are you? We asked the, this question, like this as, as you were signing up to the campaign, what kind of school are you? Mm. And I did have head teachers saying, lonely. Mm. And that's, so it's the three pieces of advice. It's firstly, you're not alone. You may be alone within your immediate school community, but within the global community that we can all be part of, you're not alone. So reach out and connect, get involved in things like Active Classroom Day, but also in groups like um, you know, LEAF, London Education Environment Forum, like London National Park City Schools, like get, reach out to connections elsewhere. Secondly, it's like start doing something small within your school and then reach out to the parents. There will be parents out there. There will be children there who want to start we found with Outdoor Classroom Day, a lot of people got involved just the nursery, and then it'd be nursery in, in Key Stage 1. And then it's the whole school. It's, people see the positive effects, they can like keep changing. And also work on your governors, because if your governor, if you get a governor who really champions it, you'll get to change the whole system. Thanks so much, uh, Kath. I, I think, you know, and even being in rooms like this, I hope makes people feel less alone. Caroline, would you like to um, to comment on that? 
I will. Um, I'm going to comment on the first question briefly and then the second one. Um, the University of Bath has got me teaching this climate psychology material to chemical engineering students now. So what we're trying to do at Bath is integrate it throughout the curriculum. So I really want us to be seeing how we can be teaching uh, climate change, sustainability, climate psychology in every single class uh, and not separating them out at all. And the second one, actually, it's already been brilliantly answered. It's about community and it's about coming together to share thoughts and ideas, but also how we feel about this. And we've had a lot of talk today, uh, really interesting about whether this is an object or where it's a subject, but it's also, you know, we're, we're human beings involved in this ourselves. So, you know, in Climate Psychology Alliance, we've been running sort of support groups and climate cafes and workshops for teachers and parents and young people. And I've put the link to the resources. There's some amazing work being done, join communities. And if there isn't a community, create a new one. And if you can't do that on your own, ask us and we'll help you. Well, thanks. Thank you so much. Those are really beautiful questions. We are at time um, now. I'm so sorry. I feel that it would be lovely to continue the conversation all day. Um, I think it is an ongoing conversation between all of us, actually, and it's just so wonderful to, you know, with huge thanks to Melanie for making this happen because it weaves the web together of the people who are, you know, who are working in this field and together we're all exponentially uh, stronger. So I think it, it's so powerful to see everybody today and I hope it addresses those feelings of, of, being, of, of, of feeling alone or isolated quite quite clearly, uh, we are not. So um, I'll just, we've, we've lost a couple of members of our panel, but just a, a final word um, for each from, from each of you to, 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 for people to take forward. I, I can only give you you know, two words each, but it'd be lovely to have that inspiration. Kath? Go outside and play. Wonderful. Caroline? I'm going to echo that. Use play to learn to talk about difficult things. Anne? I was asked this once by um, the head of a government department, and he said, what's the, what's the answer to sustainability? And I said, persistence. He hated it. He hated the answer. <laughs> I think it's wonderful and you embody that. I know you'll just never give up. Don't give up, no. That's true. <laughs> B, quite last word from B. I'm going to kind of echo Anne and just say shout louder because one day they'll have to listen. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Huge thanks to you all and a huge thanks to Malini as well once more for making this possible. Thank you. thank you very much, Cindy. Thank you very much for such fantastic sharing and for the incredible words of empathy and wisdom, insight and action. Um, we're going to continue the community's theme because we are in charge of the conversations that we create, not somebody else. So I'm just delighted that we were able to convene this session, which nominally is on curriculum, but communities has come out because as Anne said at the very beginning, it is about change and us. So thank you very much. I'm gonna close this session now and invite you to come back at 1.45 to join us for the community session. Thank you all once again.